The Tower Treasure, Chapter 3, Traces of the Thief Chet Morton's roadster was a brilliant yellow, not easily mistaken, and the Hardy Boys were confident that it would not be difficult to pick up the trail of the auto thief. The car is pretty well known around Bayport, said Chet. It was certainly a happy-looking wagon, and one who saw it would remember it. Seems strange that an auto thief would take a car like that, remarked Frank. Auto thieves usually take cars of a standard make and a standard color. They're easier to get rid of. He would know that a car like yours would be easily traced. I don't think he stole the car to sell it, Joe pointed out. Take it from me, that chap was getting away from some place in a hurry, and when his own car had got smashed, he just took the first one that came to hand. If we keep after him, before he has a chance to get rid of it, we'll run him to earth. A number of men in a hayfield nearby attracted Frank's attention, and he brought his motorcycle to a stop. I'm going to ask these chaps if they saw him pass. Frank scrambled over the fence and went over to talk to the farm hands, who watched him approach with curiosity. Didn't see a yellow roadster passed here within the last hour, did you? One of them, a lanky old farmer with a sunburned nose, carefully laid down his scythe, put his hand to his ear, and shouted, "Eh? Did you see a fellow pass along here in a roadster? Frank repeated in a louder tone. The farmer turned to his companions, removed a plug of tobacco from the pocket of his overalls, and took a hearty chaw. Lad here wants to know if we saw a roadster come by here, he said slowly. There were three other farmhands, and all gathered round. They put down their sides very deliberately, and the plug of tobacco was duly passed round the group. Frank waited. A roadster, eh? asked one. A yellow roadster, Frank told him. One of the men removed his hat and mopped his brow. Seems to me, he observed, I did see a car come by here a while ago. A yellow car. No, twasn't a yellow car. It was a delivery truck, if I remember rightly. Frank strove to conceal his impatience. It was a roadster I was asking about, a yellow roadster. Not one of them coupés, eh? asked the old man with a group doubtfully looking on. No, not a coop, a roadster. Roadster, eh? remarked the old farmer. That one of them little automobiles with just two seats and a little cupboard in the back, eh? My cousin has one, observed another member of the group. He got it second hand in Bayport. Never could see why he bought the doggone thing, for you can't take the folks for a ride in it without having em all crowded something fearful. Give me the old touring car every time. Can't say as I agree with you, returned the old farmer. What good's a touring car if you want to haul a load of grain into town? Once them little trucks is the best for me, I've always thought. Then if you want to go on a picnic or anything, the family can climb in the back. You get the use out of the car like that. Nope. Nothing like a touring car. Rank extravagance buying a touring car, put in another. Horse and wagon is good enough for me. That's what I say, agreed the fourth. With that taxes the way they is. And last year's coupe wasn't any too good. I tell you a touring car is the only thing nowadays. Somewhat astonished by the sudden turn of argument had taken, Frank vainly tried to make his voice heard in the uproar. But what about the roadster, he asked. Did any of you see it? But the four men in the field were not listening. Instead, they were deep in highly complicated arguments regarding the faults and merits of various makes of cars, and they paid no further attention to the youth. Can't afford to waste any more time here, he said to himself and turned away. At the fence, he'd looked back. One of the farm hands was shaking his fist beneath the nose of a companion, while the other two were engrossed in a heated discussion. Their voices floated across the hayfield in the drowsy summer morning. It looks as if you started something, laughed Joe, as his brother returned to the motorcycle. I certainly did. Just asked them if they'd seen a yellow roadster, and they started to fight about what was the best car for a farmer to buy. "'And didn't they see the roadster?' asked Chet. "'I don't think so. "'If they had, they would have told me. "'I guess they were glad to have an excuse to quit work. 
Well, we'd better be getting on our way then. We've lost enough time already. So while the four farm hands wrangled loudly in the fields, in an argument that bid fair to last until dinner time at least, the three boys set out again in pursuit of the red headed auto thief. They were approaching Bayport when they saw a girl walking along the road ahead of them. There was something familiar about her appearance, and as they drew near, Frank's face lighted up, for he recognized the girl as Callie Shaw, who was in his class at Bayport High School. As the boys brought their motorcycle to a stop, Frank saw that Callie was not in her usual bright and cheery humor. Under one arm, she was carrying a parcel that had evidently become untied and the paper of which was badly torn. Her face was distressed and appeared that she had been crying. Callie looked up and recognized the boys, ran over towards them. What an awful man, she wailed, even before they had time to ask her what the matter was. He ran right over my parcel and smashed nearly all the cakes and jelly that I was bringing to Mrs. Wills. And with that, she held out the torn parcel. Frank knew that Callie, who was a generous and good-hearted girl, had been in the habit of taking little delicacies to the widow, Mrs. Wills, who lived just on the outskirts of Bayport. Now he saw that the parcel had been smashed so that only one glass of jelly and a few of the cakes had been left intact. What man, Callie? he asked. What happened? He ran right over my parcel. Just then Callie spied Chet Morton, and she pouted at him. He must have been a friend of yours, too, Chet Morton, for he was driving your car. My car? gasped Chet. Your yellow roadster. He came driving along this road at such a terrible speed that I was frightened and I dropped my parcel, and then he ran right over it. Why, Callie, that's just the fellow we've been looking for, said Frank quickly. Chet's car's been stolen. Well, whoever stole it came by here not ten minutes ago, said the girl, and he's a madman by the way he was driving. Why, we're right on his trail then, declared Frank. We must have gone into Bayport. He was heading that way, Callie told them, but at the rate he was going, you'll have a hard time catching up to him. Oh, Chet, I'm so sorry your car was stolen. Don't worry, we'll get it back, replied Chet grimly. Are you going back home, Callie? asked Frank. No, I'm going up to Mrs. Will's place. You needn't bother to drive me up. It's only a few yards farther on. I know you're anxious to chase that awful man. We'll chase him, all right, declared Frank, as the motorcycles roared. They bade goodbye to the girl and sped on their way into Bayport, leaving Callie to continue her journey to the home of Mrs. Wills. With the remains of the cake and jelly over which she had spent so much time and care, they sped down the main street to Bayport and headed directly to the police station, where they intended to report the theft of Chet's car and a description of the thief, assuming him to be the red-headed man who had so nearly run down Frank and Joe on the shore road. And when they reached the police station, a further surprise was waiting for them. Chapter 4 The Hold-Up Chief Ezra Colleg of the Bayport Police Force was a burly, red-faced individual much given to telling long-winded stories. Usually Colleg was to be found reclining in a swivel chair in his office, with his feet on the desk, reading a comic paper, or polishing up his numerous badges. But this day something had happened to shake him out of his customary calm. When the boys went into his office, they found the chief painfully writing in a huge notebook, and confronting, confronted by three excited figures— one of them was I. Carity, the old ticket seller at the city steamboat office. The others were Detective Smoof of the police force and Policeman Con Riley, both trying their best to look important and composed. I. Carity was frankly frightened. It was plain that something very much out of the ordinary had happened. Carity was a timid and inoffensive old chap who had perched on a high stool behind the wicket at the steamboat office day in and day out for as many years as any one in Bayport could remember. I was just counting up the morning's receipts, he was saying in a frightened and high pitched voice, when it came this fellow. He sticks a revolver in front of my nose, 
"'Just a minute,' interrupted the chief, grandly, as the boys entered. He dipped his pen in the inkwell and poised it in the air, as he peered at the lads over his spectacles. "'What are you boys doing here? Can't you see we're busy?' "'I came to report a theft,' said Chet Morton. "'My roadster's been stolen.' "'Why, it was a roadster this fellow drove up in my office,' cried Ike Herity. "'A yellow roadster. Ha!' said Detective Smoof. "'A clue!' He immediately fished a notebook out of his pocket and began rummaging around for a pencil. "'Never mind, Detective Smoof,' observed the chief heavily. "'I'll take down any notes that are needed.' Detective Smoof duly squelched, put back his notebook book in confusion. "'What fellow?' Frank asked. "'Who drove up to your office in a yellow roadster?' "'The hold-up man,' declared Harity. "'I was held up this morning. A fellow tried to steal the steamboat money on me.' "'Now, just a minute, just a minute,' declared the chief. "'Let me say a word here. The situation is this.' A man drove up to the steamboat office a little while ago and tried to hold up Mr. Harity. But a passenger happened to come into the office just then and frightened this fellow away. Is that right? That's right, said Harity. I'll make a note of it, said the chief, suiting the action to the word. When he had scribbled industriously for some time, he raised a pen again and pointed it at Chet. Now you, he observed, say that somebody stole a yellow roadster on this off of you this morning. Yes, sir, from our farm. We seen him driving into Bayport just a little while ago. The chief made a note of it. And you, he said, pointing the pen at I Carity, say the hold up man drove up to the office in a yellow roadster. That's right, chief. That's right. A yellow roadster it was. And now I come to think of it. I've seen Chet Morton's car before, and it was the spitting image of it. Then, declared the chief, putting down his pen with the air of one making a momentous discovery, it looks to me very much as if the hold-up man and the fellow that stole the car are one and the same man. Detective Smoof wagged his head solemnly in admiration of this feat of deduction. I believe you're right, Chief, he declared. Of course he's right, said Frank. It couldn't be anyone else. The point is this. Where did the hold-up man go? Did he leave the car? Did you follow the man? He left in the yellow car all right, said Harity, but nobody followed him. I telephoned for the police. Did you notice the color of the man's hair? asked Frank suddenly. What's that got to do with it? asked the detective Smoof. Never mind. It may have a great deal to do with it. Did you notice the color of his hair? repeated Frank, turning to Harity. It was short, said Harity firmly. Short and dark. Frank and Joe looked blankly at one another. "'Are you sure?' asked Joe. "'I'm positive,' declared Harity. "'I was face to face with him. "'He was a dark-haired man with hair that was cut awful short. "'I noticed that.' "'You're sure he wasn't red-headed?' "'I'm sure of it.' "'What's all this about?' asked Chief Collig suspiciously. "'What has the color of his hair to do with it?' "'Well,' admitted Frank, "'we were pretty sure that the man who stole Chet's car had long red hair.' Hmm muttered the chief doubtfully. Then, if that was the case, the man who stole the car and the man who tried to hold up the office isn't one and the same fellow after all. I don't know what to make of it, confessed Frank. Just then a short, nervous little man was ushered into the office. He introduced himself as the passenger who had gone into the steamboat office at the time of the attempted hold-up, and he presented himself in answer to a call from the chief. In reply to the question, the newcomer, who gave the prosaic name of Henry J. Brown, said he was from New York, told of entering the office and seeing a man run away from the wicket with a revolver in his hand. "'What color was his hair, did you notice?' asked Frank eagerly. "'I can't say I did,' answered the little man. "'It all happened so quickly I didn't realize that it was a hold-up man until he was out of the door.' Then I saw him jump into the roadster and drive away. Wait a minute, I did notice the color of his hair, just as the car was disappearing down the road. You couldn't help notice he was red-headed. He had long red hair. Detective Smoof looked blankly at the chief, and the chief looked blankly at everybody else, particularly at Henry J. Brown of New York. I knew it, declared Joe, 
exultantly. It's the same man. It can't be the same man, said the chief wearily. You boys don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Herity says that he had short dark hair. Now, how could he have short dark hair and long red hair at the same time? I ask you that. How could it be? Chief Collig pronounced this query with the expression of one who was triumphantly settled all difficulties. He had short dark hair, said Herity doggedly. And I'm sure he had long red hair, shouted Henry J. Brown, very indignantly. Do you think I'm blind? Do you think I'd tell a lie about it? He had dark hair. He had red. It was dark. It wasn't. It was. Stop it, commanded Chief Collig. I don't think either of you know what kind of hair he had. Probably he ha he was a bald-headed man. But I'll send word to keep a watch for the yellow roadster. I'll notify the police in the other towns. I guess that's all we can do for now. With that, the Hardy Boys and Chet Morton had to be content. When they left the office, it was a little hope that the thief or the car would be found. Their misgivings were justified. When they returned to see Chief Collig that night, they learned that no word had been received concerning the Yellow Roadster for any of the outlying towns or villages, and that despite the diligent search conducted by Detective Smoof and other members of the Bayport Force, the roadster had not been located in the city. Chapter 5 Chet's Auto Horn Fenton Hardy, the internationally famous detective, was reading in the library of his home that evening when his sons tapped on the door. Although he was a very busy man, Mr. Hardy was not the type of father who maintains an air of aloofness from his family, the result being that he was on good terms with the boys. "'Come in!' he shouted cheerfully, putting aside his book, and when Frank and Joe entered the room, he motioned to a deep leather sofa near the window. "'Sit down. What have you been doing all day? Burning up the roads in the country, I suppose.' He grinned amiably at them and puffed vigorously on his pipe. "'Well, we didn't travel very far today, Dad,' Frank replied. "'We were, well, we were investigating,' prompted Joe. "'Aha!' exclaimed Mr. Hardy in mock surprise. "'So my sons were investigating, eh? "'What was it, a murder? "'A plot to blow up the White House? "'A train wreck? "'Something big, I hope.' "'No, not quite that bad,' admitted Frank. "'It was a car theft.' Mr. Hardy shook his head. "'I'm disappointed in you,' he said solemnly. "'I really am. "'To think that sons of mine should investigate a car thief. "'I thought you, would, you wouldn't you would bother about anything less than a murder.' "'His eyes twinkled, and the Hardy boys were accustomed to their father's good-natured banters, "'smiled back at him. "'We weren't just practicing detective work, Dad,' explained Frank. "'You see, Chet Morton's roadster was stolen this morning.' "'Is that so?' exclaimed Mr. Hardy, genuinely concerned. "'Why, that's too bad. "'Chet was mighty proud of that car, wasn't he?' "'Yes, he was. "'And it hasn't been found yet. "'No trace of the thief.' "'He tried to hold up the steamboat ticket office after he stole the car. "'Mr. Hardy whistled. "'Why, you have been on a case worth while. "'Tell me all about that.' "'He settled back in his chair while his sons told him the story of the day's doings. "'When they told of the difference of opinion as to the color of the man's hair, "'he did not laugh with them as they had expected over the argument between Harity and Mr. Brown.' On the contrary, he knitted his brows, and his face wore a serious expression. "'It wasn't any ordinary auto theft you were dealing with,' he said slowly. "'I've no doubt the man who tried to rob the ticket office and the man who almost ran you down on the shore road are one and the same, and the same man stole Chet Morton's car. But how about the color of his hair?' "'There must have been two men,' said Joe. "'Think so?' I have my own theories, but then the average witness is very unreliable, for instance. I'll give you a test. You have each seen Superintendent Norton of Bayport High School. Well, haven't you? How often? About two or three thousand times, I guess, answered Frank, over a period of three years. Well, what color is his hair? 
Frank looked blankly at Joe. Why, it's... it's... Joe scratched his head. Brown, isn't it? I think it's black. You see, said Mr. Hardy, smiling. Your powers of observation have not been trained. A good detective has to school himself to remember all sorts of little facts about that. Until he gets to be a habit with him. Both of you have been looking at Mr. Norton for about three years, and you don't know the color of his hair. And if I asked you whether he has the habit of wearing lace shoes or button shoes, you would be stumped altogether. As a matter of fact, Mr. Norton is bald. He wears a chestnut wig. You never noticed that, did you? He always wears button shoes. He belongs to the Elks, and his favorite author is Dickens. The boys looked at their father in amazement. But, Dad, you've never met him. I've never been introduced to him, but I've passed him on the street a number of times. When your powers of observation have been trained as mine have been, it's no trick at all to take away a mental photograph of a man after seeing him once. If you are specially observant, it isn't hard to notice such details as regarding the wig. A wig never has the same appearance as natural hair. But how do you know he belongs to the Elks? asked Joe. He wears the lodge emblem as a watch charm. And how do you know his favorite author is Dickens? On three separate occasions, I met Mr. Norton, and I noticed that he was carrying a book. Once it was Oliver Twist, another time it was A Tale of Two Cities, and the third time it was David Copperfield. So I judged that his favorite author must be Dickens. Am I right? He always talks Dickens to us in school, said Frank. It's simple enough once you get the habit, remarked Mr. Hardy. You must train yourselves to be observant, so that in time you will automatically remember little details about people you meet and places you visited. Now, if Harity and Mr. Brown have been all at all observant in spite of the fact that they were surprised and frightened, they would have been able to give the police a very thorough description of the man who tried to hold up the steamboat office. If the man happened to be a professional thief, the description would have helped the officers ascertain who he was, because once a man has served a prison term, his description is kept on file. As it is, all we know about him is that he probably has red hair. It isn't very much to go on. I'm afraid Chet... "'Hasn't much chance of recovering his roadster,' said Joe. "'You never can tell,' remarked his father. "'It may turn up sometime. "'Perhaps the thief will get himself into trouble yet. "'Keep your ears and eyes open. "'And now, if you wouldn't mind, I have some reports to write.' "'Joe and Frank took the hint and left their father to his work. "'But although they talked long into the night "'on possible ways and means of recovering Chet's car,' They were able to de devise no plan for tracing the thief. And through the week that followed, there were no further clues. Chet had given up all hope of seeing the roadster again. I sure miss all that old bus, he told the Hardy boys, after school on Friday afternoon. I have to take my chances on catching rides in and out of town now. Why, last night I walked halfway home before a car came along and gave me a lift. Saturdays will be pretty dull for you now. You just bet your sweet life they'll be dull. Nothing to do but sit around the farm. Better come with us tomorrow, suggested Joe. A bunch of us are going fishing near the dam. You can meet us at the crossroads near Willow River. Good idea, said Chet. What time? Oh, ten o'clock. Fine, I'll be there. Gosh, I see where I can get a ride home. There goes a hay wagon and it's heading right to the farm next to mine. A long wagon rumbled slowly towards the boys, a lean, solemn farmer perched on the front seat, half asleep. The horses dwaddled along. That's Lim Billers, the laziest man in nine counties, said Chet. Watch me have fun with him. Chet looked from... Chet took from his pocket an automobile horn. He had originally bought it for the roadster, but had not had a chance to install it before the car was stolen. The horn was a new type, very small, yet it had a particularly raucous shriek. The hardy boys grinned as they saw Chet 
step out into the road and swing himself lightly up on the back of the wagon. Mr. Billers was bringing some supplies back to the farm, and Chet was hidden from view by a bag of flour. As the wagon rumbled past, Chet sounded the automobile horn. It shrieked sharply and instantaneously. Mr. Billers, being a lazy man, did not even look behind. He simply tugged lightly at the reins, and the horses edged over to the side of the road. Having heard the horn, Mr. Billers expected an automobile to pass by. But when no car flashed by, he turned indolently to his seat and looked behind. The roadway was clear. There was not an automobile in sight. He did not see Chet doubling up with laughter on the back of the wagon. He gazed doubtfully at the Hardy Boys, who were standing at the curb trying to conceal their smiles. "'Could have sworn I heard a horn,' grunted Mr. Billers. Then he tugged at the lines and brought the horses into the middle of the road again. Instantly the horn shrieked again. This time it was even louder and more instant than before. It seemed that an automobile was right behind the wagon, clamoring to pass. Almost automatically, Mr. Billers yanked the reins, and the horses again went to the side of the road, but again no car went by. Again Mr. Billers looked behind. Again, in his astonishment, he saw the roadway was clear. "'Hang if I didn't think I heard a horn!' exclaimed Mr. Billers, greatly puzzled as he drove on again. "'My ears must be going!' But in a few minutes, the horn shrieked again. Frank and Joe, who were walking along the sidewalk, keeping abreast of the wagon, so as not to miss the fun, chuckled as they saw Mr. Billers once more pull on the reins to guide the horses to the roadside. Then the farmer recollected how he had been fooled on the previous occasions, and he looked quickly round. But there was no car in sight. Mr. Billers gazed down the roadway for a long time. Then he sighed with the air of one whose patience had been long tried. "'Must be something the matter with my ears,' he muttered and drove on. At this moment a luxurious sedan swept round a corner and drew up close behind the wagon. There was a chauffeur at the wheel, and he sounded his horn impatiently, for the road was narrow and he was unable to get past. Liam Billers smiled darkly to himself and paid no attention. There it goes again, he grumbled. I must be hearing things. Hang me if I'll turn around again, and there's no car to pass. The wagon continued to the center of the road, and the chauffeur of the car glared at Liam Billers' back and sounded the horn again. Still the farmer paid no attention. Chet, limp with laughter, almost rolled off the wagon. Frank and Joe could control their mirth no longer, and leaned against a telephone post with shouts of glee. The chauffeur, believing the boys were laughing at him because he could not get past the, the wagon, became purple with anger. He sounded the horn again and again, and finally, when Liam Billers obstinately refused to pay any attention, he looked wildly about for a policeman. As luck would have it, Constable Con Riley was ambling along Main Street at that moment, wondering if his if he would soon have supper time and hoping his wife would serve him corned beef and cabbage that evening. He was aroused from his trance by the chauffeur, who brought the sedan to a stop and ran over to him. Officer, arrest that man, roared the chauffeur, pointing to Lim Billers. What for? demanded Con taking off his helmet and scratching his head. Obstructing traffic? He won't let me pass. I've been sounding my horn for the last five minutes, and he won't let me go past. Oh ho, said Constable Riley. He can't get away with that, not while Con Riley's on the beat. And with that, he ran into the road, shouting to Liam Billers to stop. At that, the constable's command, the farmer halted his team and gazed in amazement at the chauffeur and the officer as they came running up to him. "'Why won't you let him pass?' demanded the constable. "'Don't say you didn't hear me,' roared the chauffeur. "'I sounded my horn fifty times.' "'Sure, I heard a horn,' admitted Billers. But he added triumphantly, "'I didn't see no car.' "'Are you blind?' said Riley. "'There's the car.' Lim Billers looked behind. At sight of the sedan, his jaw dropped. Well, I'll be hanged, he declared sadly. 
It must be my eyes going back on me, not my ears. I looked behind three times, and I couldn't see no car. Don't believe him, officer, said the chauffeur. He didn't even turn round. I did so, contended Mr. Billers. Then why didn't you let me pass? You didn't have no car. I heard a horn, but I didn't see no car. Thereupon the argument grew fast and furious, and Constable Riley was vastly puzzled. He didn't know what to make of it. Both the chauffeur and Lean Billers appeared to be telling the truth, yet there was something wrong somewhere. He took it all down in a notebook, while Mr. Billers and the chauffeur grew angrier and angrier at each other, until finally they were on the point of settling matters with their fists. In the meantime, there was a steadily lengthening line of cars and wagons blocking the street, unable to get past because the hay wagon and the sedan, a constant chorus of automobile horns sounded, angry drivers roared at the officer to clear the road. Officer Riley threw up his hands in disgust. Get on your way, both of you, he commanded. I can't stand here arguing all afternoon. And while Liam Billers, wondering whether his eyes or his ears had deceived him, drew his horses to the side of the road and muttered strong threats of vengeance against the chauffeur, the traffic tangle gradually abated. When he finally resumed his journey, the hardy boys could see Chet Morton lying limply in the back of the wagon with tears of laughter running down his face. As for Frank and Joe, they laughed all the way home, and during supper that evening, their spasmodic outbursts of chuckles puzzled their parents extremely.